you want to add value to other people and it doesn't even necessarily have to be real estate related you know yes it's great if you're able to raise money or you're able to find deals or, or you know some kind of real estate related value but let's say you meet somebody who maybe they want to play the guitar and if you know how to play the guitar you can offer them some free lessons right there in an instant value like and then they're going to like you and then they're going to want to do business with you or uh, you, you never know where things go with this but uh, by adding value to everybody around you at all times think good things are going to come back your way Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Matt Jones is the CEO of Hawkwing Capital, which raises capital from passive investors to own large apartment buildings. And he also wrote the book about real estate. That literally is the name, the book about real estate, and co-host the Pillars of Wealth Creation podcast. He also owns 244 beds of senior assisted living. Matt, welcome to the show. Hey, good to be here. Hey, man. Thanks for coming on today. There's three questions I ask every guest who comes to the show. In 90 seconds or less, can you tell me where did you start, where are you now, and how did you get there? So in 2015, I bought my first uh, triplex. I was live-in. I house hacked it, and I saved up money from my W-2. It took me a few years before I was able to buy a second triplex, and I was just uh, so frustrated at how slow my progress was going. Like the mm -hmm. idea was like eventually own like a large uh, complex, and I was like, oh, this is going to take me 40 years before I can scale up at this pace. Right. And then I learned about uh, real estate syndication in 2019, and thought like, oh, this is bananas. Like like it. it uh, solves all my problems with, you know, now I don't have to save up my own money. I can use other people's money and I don't have to wait to scale up to bigger properties. I can just jump in and start right now. And so then I uh, found a mentor to help me out uh, who actually I co-host the podcast with now. Hmm. And um, I recently raised uh, some capital uh, with him for a 228 deal in um, uh, Kentucky and then um, looking to raise capital for some other deals as well. Man, that's uh, that's really really cool. I mean, 2019 till now, now that's pretty uh, that's pretty fast progress, I would say. I mean, what are some things, you know? I know you said you you had a, a mentor, but what are some other things you feel like you did right that other people should emulate? I think well, the biggest hurdle that I had to get over was my own mindset. So if you can you know, change your mind of thinking like, how can I do this rather than like, oh, I, I couldn't buy a, a hundred unit place. Like whether you say you can or you can't, you're right. You know, I think it was Henry Ford that said that. And uh, so, you know, getting into the mindset, like I can do this. I just need to figure out how, or better yet, who I can work with to get me to that level. Right. Right. That's uh, that's really, really cool. Tell me, what what are you guys doing? You know, I heard you say something about an opportunity there in Louisville. What, what are you guys doing right now to find opportunity? You know, you, you moved on from the triplex world because that was too slow growth. You moved into mostly multifamily and I hear some also assisted living. But what, what does opportunity look like for you right now? It's primarily through uh, broker relationships. So, mm -hmm. you know, built to connections with brokers. And so we're seeing a lot of on-market uh, deals. But, uh, um, you know, I, I think some people prefer off-market or on-market. But, I mean, with on-market, it's uh, you, you get all the numbers. Like, it's presented in a way that the, the, the seller is ready to sell. And uh, you have uh, the broker there to help make sure everything falls into place. So uh, plus uh, through on-market deals, we, we get a lot of deal flow. Mm -hmm. And right now you got to look through a lot of stinkers before you find that one gem. <laughs> yeah, you do. How are you underwriting those to, 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 to where it, you know, to where it makes sense? I mean, you know, that's what we're seeing a lot of, a lot in you know, across all asset classes is, is you're just going, I, I don't even, I don't even know how the current buyer is making this pencil. So what are you guys doing differently? You feel like? Well, we just go through the numbers. I mean, yeah, the I'd say yeah, 99 out of 100 deals, we just kind of shake our heads at like, <laughs> I don't know how this is going to work at that price point. But, uh, you know, yeah, once in a while, we find that uh, one that actually does pencil in. And then when we think, uh, oh, what, what did we do wrong in the underwriting? Uh, but we're still underwriting conservatively. We're still, you know, stress testing the numbers to make sure like, okay, if if there's another recession and we get to like the record high vacancy rates or, or record high uh, concessions and things like that, is the property still going to make money to ride through a potential recession? If yes, then that is a good deal. But uh, a lot of these properties are, like you say, they're going at these prices that uh, if anything goes wrong for these operators, uh, they're going to lose their pants. Talk to us about positioning. You know, how are you positioning yourself in front of 
the sellers. It's a, it's a, it's almost an art, I think, of putting yourself in front of the sellers in a way that makes the seller want to work with you, which is kind of a weird place to be in the in the cycle where it's like, hey, wait, like, why am I trying to court you? Shouldn't you be courting me as the buyer? But it's not the way it's working. What are you guys doing on that front? Well, it uh, comes down to relationships as well. Relationships with our, uh, you know, lenders, property management, the brokers. When you can build a reputation, or if you don't have one right now, partner with people who already have a good reputation, and so you can say, like, you know, my team, you know, this is our experience, uh, and to show to the sellers that, like, uh, yes, we can close. We've closed on you know X number of units, and you know, taken so many units to uh, you know, full cycle and such. And we already have the professional property management, you know, that's local, that's going to do a good job, that uh, already does a great job with these other properties. Just to show the seller, like, yes, we can close. Yes, it's going to go smoothly, and you know, we can make it happen. Right now, I saw you know we read that there in your uh, in your bio there in the in- intro that you are also involved in assisted living. So is that a is that a a core focus for you, or is that just an opportunity that came your way and you participated in it? Walk us through uh, kind of being diversified uh, across asset classes. Yeah, that was an opportunity that came up my way, and uh, the numbers were really good. I mean, it had an IRR of uh, twenty one plus, so I couldn't say no to that. Um, and uh, I come from a background of managing like group homes for adults who have disabilities. So mm. it's really, really similar, uh, the operation side, which I'm really well versed with. And uh, so, and multifamily is where my focus is, but it's on a different cycle than senior assisted living. You know, like multifamily is high right now, senior assisted living uh, in a lot of times, and we focus on rural areas actually, uh, it, it's cheap. So we can buy these mom and pop shops for a song from operators who didn't do well during the uh COVID, but uh, you know we're hitting the silver tsunami uh, here with the baby boomers that are getting to that age where they need uh, or starting to need more intensive care from senior assisted living, and uh, so there's just a lot of opportunity right now. Uh, the you know demand is going to be much stronger than supply here shortly. That is is that when you when you look at things like that is that a uh, a potential core focus for you when you see opportunity. Yeah, I think it, there's the potential that we might uh, shift uh, focus to that being our primary. But I mean, multifamily is our bread and butter. Uh, you know, we understand that we've we've done well with it, and we know how it works. Got it. Got it. That's uh, that that is very very interesting. Tell me what's what's a uh, an excellent piece of advice that you were given, say like in 2019 when you said, "Hey, I want to switch. I want to go into something that can scale quickly." What's something somebody told you you feel like that that everyone else should also hear? You have to add value to other people without expecting value in return. And, you know, if you try to just take and take from other people, you know, take their knowledge, take their time, take their money without giving anything in return, you know, you're going to, it's really off putting. Like you, uh, you want to add value to other people. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be real estate related. You know, yes, it's great if you're able to raise money or you're able to find deals or, or, you know, some kind of real estate related value. But let's say you meet somebody who, Maybe they want to play the guitar, and if you know how to play the guitar, you can offer them some free lessons right there. Instant value, like, and then they're going to like you, and then they're going to want to do business with you. Or uh, you, you never know where things go with this. But uh, by adding value to everybody around you at all times, think good things are going to come back your way. What are some surprises uh, or potential pitfalls, maybe that you learned or that you feel like other people should avoid? I mean, I think my biggest mistake starting out was trying to do it all on my own. You know, mm-hmm. I consider myself a smart guy, you know, very capable. And so I was trying to do everything on my own and I was just spinning my wheels for years before I realized I needed to take a nice big slice of humble pie. And, you know, I, you know, I'm very shy. Uh, and so I had to force myself to network with other people and uh, just get out there and, and find people to partner with, uh, to make things. And, and once I did, uh, you know, my, my career propelled much faster than I, I could have on my own. When you 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 do do a lot of ed, a lot of education in this space, I think that's where your book about real estate really comes in. What are some of the common questions or common things that people come to you and you say, "Hey, we're going to start at square one." What's square one for you? And then wh- how do you kind of work them through the process? Square one is exploring the different types of asset classes and deciding which one, uh, you know, two at the most, but preferably one that you want to focus on right away. And because like, there's a million different ways to make money in real estate. And if you try to do them all, 
you're going to do them all poorly. So you're much more better uh, being niche uh, and focused. And like my book, it covers the whole spectrum of real estate investing. So to help people explore, you know, like self storage units or, or mobile home parks or multifamily or you know all these different things. And then you choose like, okay, this one makes the most sense to me. This one I think I can do, and then become specialized in that. Got it. Got it. So yeah, if I'm hearing you right, you say, you know, pick two at the most asset classes. And that goes back to the, and I'm even going to contradict your statement there a little bit, but it said, you know, he, he who chases two rabbits, cases, he who chases two rabbits catches none, mm-hmm. right? If I could speak today. Um, and I, I like that idea of that. You got, you got to really, that there's a lot of ways in this business that you can make a lot of money. Talk to us about success. If you were to define success for you, what is success and where do you look, where, what, what does success look like for you in the future? You know, success is just, uh, you know, having goals that really expand you as a person and, and having a good plan to be able to achieve those. Uh, so whatever it may be, whether it's financial freedom, so you can hang out with your family more or uh, being able to travel, uh, which I enjoy, uh, you know, just, I, I guess, living the kind of life that you want and, and, and taking the actions necessarily to make that happen. And as for the future, uh, I anticipate I, I'll transition more from uh, an active uh, investor, you know, to a passive investor so that I'll just have my, my various uh, investments and enjoy the, the uh, free money that shows up in my bank account. I hear that, man. I'm a passive investor in a lot of deals, and I can't wait till that is that is all I am. I love being an active investor, but there's something really special about that uh, ACH in your account once a month. And you're like, oh, that was that was relatively easy. I could do more of that. So yeah. absolutely hear that. Raising capital. You went out and said, hey, you know, I've, I've figured out that this industry, I don't have to have all the money myself. I can go out and pool other people's capital and take down deals. Talk to us about the capital raise side for you. Can you walk us through that journey, getting your first deal done, uh, maybe some of the hiccups or the things that you would do differently on that front? Yeah. Well, I guess just in general, when you're raising capital, you want to make sure you're, you're, you know, the people that you're raising capital from, you know, understand what they're getting into. So, mm. you know, you don't want to be uh, like some scammer type of person. You know, I'm very upfront and honest. So, uh, you know, I, I make sure that I'm not taking somebody's like last $50,000, for example. I, I don't want that. Like if, if you need that money to live off of, this is not the right kind of thing for you. No. Uh, you know, so I, I, you know, first make sure that they understand that, like the, the risks and, and potential rewards and, and what will happen with their money. And, um, uh, and then I, you know, show them like what, you know, that like I'm, I myself am investing my own money into the deals that I'm raising capital for. I right. uh, just to increase their confidence that, uh, okay, like he's putting his money where his mouth is. So that this must be a good deal. Right. Right. What were there strategies or, um, you know, I guess methods you employed on your first hmm. capital raise? Yeah. I, well, I mean, it's, you start out with friends and family and, uh, like work acquaintances and, you know, people like that. But I, I would say my approach is, you know, I, I first ask somebody like, hey, could I ask you uh, a couple of questions about your finances? And if they say, they, they're, you know, usually say yes. If they say no, you know, that's fine. Uh, but once they say yes, then you say like, um, would you be open to a 10% return on your money uh, you know, through an investment? And which, you know, is conservative, uh, very conservative for a real estate investment or the kinds that I'm looking at. Sure. And, and you know, they they'll generally say yes, because I mean, that's better often than the stock market will provide them uh, and you know, with their 401k and such. But, uh, you know, once they say yes, then I say like, if I found uh, an investment that could provide you with at least that much of return, uh, um, would that make sense for me to contact you about that? Um, and, and just run it by you. And then they're going to say, yeah, sure. You know, cause that doesn't hurt for me to just like tell them about something. And then, uh, okay. Like if, if I found something like that, how much money would you have available to be able to invest in that kind of deal? And then they'll tell me like, you know, whatever amount it is. And so now I've got, you know, sort of a soft commitment to, and I can shut that down and like, uh, get their contact information. You know, what's the best way for me to contact you if, if I do find a deal like that, you know, cause I, I don't have anything right now, but you know, if I do, uh, so then you can contact them, you've got their soft commitment already. And then you can show them like, Hey, there is a deal that's going to give you a, a 15% IRR or what have you. Um, then they're going to be like, all right, <laughs> here's that, uh, original money that I said. Are these conversations you're having like under what in in what environment are you having these types of conversations? All environments. I mean, because if you don't tell people about what you're doing, nobody's going to know. So you really have to be, you know, open and honest about yourself and and authentic with that. Uh, and plus, I think of it as 
all, there's all these people around me that are missing out on great opportunities if I don't tell them about it. Right. If you know, and so I'm doing them a disservice by not uh, having this conversation with them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's uh, there. You're absolutely right. There. It, it's. It. I think it's uncomfortable. I'll be honest. You're. 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 I think the questions you asked there are excellent. But I was kind of envisioning myself asking those so directly, and I'm like, oh man, that makes me uncomfortable a little bit. You know, and and, and, and like you said, in all environments, going. Hey, tell me about your finances. Like, well, maybe no. Like, okay, but but it sounds like you've had great success with that. Yeah, I would say the first time I did it, I certainly felt awkward, but it uh, I got through it, and and I'm like, oh, that wasn't so bad. I can do that again. Do you ever get any any uh, any complete just like no, no, we're not talking about that responses? You know, I haven't yet because I mean, it's not like you say like, hi, my name is Matt. Can I ask you a few questions about your finance? <laughs> Build a little rapport first, right? Uh, sure, you know. right. I get it. Okay, no, that's cool. I like that, and I think I think that's an encouragement to our audience and even to me to be more direct. Where it's just like, hey, look, you know, we've got, we, we do have excellent assets. We have excellent opportunities for investors and, you know, we're achieving amazing returns for them. And it's kind of, it's bad on me if I don't actually just go out and tell people about it. Yeah. I mean, you're keeping people from achieving their financial goals, uh, from achieving their dreams by not talking about it. Right. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. I had an investor call me. Uh, she had received her first distribution in a passive deal. And, and I mean, and maybe this is bad. It was extended family, so I, you know, don't don't hang me for uh, maybe not doing my um, my uh, inv- know your know your customer as well as maybe I could have. But they're like, hang on, wait. So I get this money, like I get a distribution, and yet I still retain my equity in the deal. I'm like, uh huh. Like you still have your hundred grand in the deal, and you're gonna still get a quarterly payout. And they're like, wow, where's this been all my life? I'm like. <laughs> I'm on. I'm on to something here. So yeah, I wish they'd understood maybe the mechanics of the deal light, slightly better, but that's okay. It all worked out. So that is fun. You're absolutely right. You know, not not sharing that stuff with your investors is is, uh, yeah, it's something. It's something we should all take take certainly more seriously. What are you guys working on right now that you are excited about? Uh, we're in between deals right now. Uh, my. You know, partner, he just did a uh, his first uh, 506C offering, which I wasn't involved with, but before that, uh, did some that raising for that 228 unit deal. So, mm. looking for the next deal. Uh, you know, being really patient, being really cautious right now because uh, you know, we're you know potentially seeing some changes, uh, I guess, in the market. But uh, you know, being prepared for that too. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Matt, I've enjoyed our time today. Certainly appreciate you coming on, telling us how to get out of the uh, triplex rat race, if you will, and how to scale and grow quickly. Certainly look forward uh, to sharing the links to your book here, the book about real estate. Again, that is the title of the book, book about real estate. That, uh, that, that, I don't know how you got that title, but that's awesome. It couldn't have been absolutely more clear. And then, you know, just some of the values that you had of the day, you know, adding, adding value to other people, without expectation is one of the ways to certainly grow. You said, you know, one of the mistakes you made early on was trying to do it all on your own. And the bigger deals we go, certainly the more this becomes a team sport. And then also about sticking to your niche and, uh, you know, not, not going too wide. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Is there any last piece of advice that you would like to share with our listeners? I mean, you know, it, it takes three things to get going in real estate. You know, educate yourself, network with other people, and most importantly, take action. Love it. Matt, for listeners want to get in touch with you, what is the best way to do that? You can go to my website, hawkwingcapital.com, and you can schedule a call with me through there. And you can also even download a free chapter from my book as well. Awesome. Matt, thanks so much for your time today. I do appreciate it. Yep, you bet.